God has specifically chosen you to be here at this time and in this place. You have incredible potential, purpose, and calling to push back the darkness and be a light for Christ. Stand for nothing and you'll fall for anything. It's time to stand your ground. This is Unapologetic. Happy Wednesday. I'm Julianne Thompson, and welcome to Unapologetic. Today, I get the honor of sitting down with international minister and best-selling author, John Bevere. John is the co-founder of Messenger International, along with his wife, Lisa. Messenger International's mission is to disciple the world, which John is definitely doing through his writing, speaking, and podcast. His newest book, The Awe of God, came out earlier this year, and I'm so excited to chat with him about his book and so much more. Welcome to the show, John. Julianne, thank you. It's a real privilege and honor to be on. Uh, I do want to start with a question that we actually ask every single person who comes on the show. So what do you think Christians should stop apologizing for and why? Stop apologizing for the truth. I mean, let me tell you why. Um, it's the truth that makes a person free. And so if you look at, I'm, I'm, I'm a father of four sons. They're 37 down to 29 right now. But when they were toddlers, Christmas was a work day. So I'm your typical dad. You know, they open up all the gifts. Dad builds all the gifts. I'm your typical dad. Break open the box, throw the pieces on the floor, right? Throw the box and the instruction manual over in the corner. And I start building the toy. An hour and a half later, I am finished building it. But there's still 10 pieces on the floor. I hit the switch. It doesn't work. What do I do? I go get the instruction manual, the guy that designed this thing, deconstruct it, construct it the way he said to construct it. And I flipped the switch and it works. Well, that's the tree of life. If you look at the garden, there was the tree of life. That was man living in God, realizing God is our creator. He's perfect love. He deeply cares for us. And we trust him, right? And then the tree of the knowledge of good and evil is, in essence, I know what's good for my life outside of God. So <clears throat> the Bible doesn't say when Eve saw the tree was evil. It said when she saw it was good. So she chose what was good for her. He chose, Adam chose what was good for him outside of the word of God. So what I get so amazed by is how, how, pe how, how people apologize for the truth or try to dumb it down or try to avoid it. I think right now in the church, in the Western church, our greatest, greatest fault is not what we're saying. It's what we're not saying. If you look at what Paul said, he said, I didn't hold back anything that was needful for eternal life to the Jews, to the Gentiles. And so I would say that would be the biggest one. What inspired you to write your latest book, The Awe of God, which explores the concept of a healthy fear of God? Well, it is, it is my life message. Um, I remember back in 1994, one of the most uh, infamous men on the planet, and all for the wrong reasons, was in, in a federal prison. He um, he was sentenced uh, every single night, every single night CNN covered his his uh, trial, then his sentencing. And he had read the first book I wrote uh, and actually called his assistant from prison and asked if I would come meet with him. I remember going into that prison and he's in all that prison garb. And uh, he said, John, we have so much to talk about. And we only have 90 minutes. And I thought, OK. And we sit down and you got to realize I'm I'm in my 30s. He is in his probably mid 50s. Had the largest ministry in the world at the time. And the first statement he made to me is this prison wasn't God's judgment on my life. It was his mercy. He said, if I would have continued to live the way I lived, I would have been separated from God for eternity and I would have been in a lake of fire. Well, right then, Julianne, I knew, oh my goodness, I'm speaking to a true, humble, broken man of God. So he shared his whole testimony, how Jesus delivered him from all the evil. He said, man, there was so much evil the first year of prison and how they had a Bible study and they would spend three hours a day, every single day in prison, studying the word and praying. So after 20 minutes of him telling me the story, my number one question, bar none, here I am a young uh, minister. I just entered in ministry within the last previous 10 years. I said to him, I said, I need to know something. At what point did you fall out of love with Jesus? 
when did you stop loving Jesus? And he looked at me and he said, I didn't. Now my walls went up and I'm like, wait a minute. You were, uh, uh, you were, I said, you were arrested in 1990. You were sentenced in, and you were arrested in 89, sentenced in 1990. You committed adultery. And I named the woman's name in 1983. You just told me you had all that evil in your life. What do you mean you did not fall out of love with Jesus? And he looked at me with the most sincere face and he said, John, I loved him all the way through it. And he saw confusion on me. And that's when he looked at me and he said, I didn't fear God. And I went, what? He said, John, there's millions of Americans. They're just like me. They love Jesus, but they have no fear of God. Now, Julianne, I look at scripture. And and when I say it's the life message, that's when my journey began. I started getting this yearning to understand the healthy fear of God. Moses makes the most amazing statement, Exodus 20, 20. He says, do not fear. He said, because Mm -hmm. God's come to test you to see if his fear is in you. Wait a minute, Mm -hmm. wait a minute. Do not fear because God's come to see if his fear is in you. Is Mm -hmm. he talking out of two sides of his mouth? No, he's differentiating between being scared of God and the fear of God. There's a difference. The person that's scared of God has something to hide. The person who fears God has nothing to hide. That person's actually terrified of being away from God. So if you want your first definition of the healthy fear of God, it's to be terrified of being away from him. Yeah. This is why Jesus delighted in it is because he stayed close to his father, his entire earthly walk. And I look, I look at, I look at how many people have walked away from the faith. Julianne, it's, 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 it's heartbreaking Barna did a study in the last 23 years, over 20 million Americans have walked away from the faith, 20 million. And these 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 Americans that have walked away from the faith, they're now professing atheists, agnostics and spiritualists. Now, 20 million people is one out of every 14 Americans, not one out of every 14 people that go to church. One out. And Paul said in the last days, there's going to be a great departure from the faith. Second Thessalonians, he said, People, there's going to be a great apostasy before that day comes. What Paul didn't say is he didn't say they wouldn't come back. So um, I look at why are we losing so many people? Why are they leaving churches? I believe it's because we've not emphasized what was Jesus's delight, God's treasure, and what matures our salvation. The road to life has a ditch on both sides. Okay, The first ditch is called legalism. All right, the church was in a legalistic ditch in the 1960s, 1970s. And God gave us a revelation in the Jesus revolution that God is a good God. He's our daddy. And the love of God, it delivered us from that ditch of legalism. But we said we want so far from legalism, we went to the other side of the road and fell in the other ditch. And that ditch is called lawlessness. Proverbs 8.13 says, by the fear of the Lord, one departs from evil. It's not by the love of God, one departs from evil. By the fear of the Mm -hmm. Lord. So Mm -hmm. it is the healthy force that Jesus delighted in that keeps us from falling away. And that's why I wrote the book, The Awe of God. And you talk about the importance of having this healthy fear of God. But what does this look like? practically how does fearing god look like on a day-to-day basis absolutely it's 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 called obedience and the manifestation the evidence that somebody truly fears god is they'll obey even if it doesn't make sense does it make sense to forgive somebody that's really hurt your family does it make sense to forgive uh to to actually bless those that are cursing you mm-hmm. it means we'll obey god if we don't see a benefit See, a lot of people, the way you can get people to obey God nowadays, especially in our Western church, is show them the benefit. Esther had nothing to gain and everything to lose, including her head. And her cousin said, hey, you've been brought into the kingdom for such a time as this. And she said, I'm going before the king. If I die, I die. She has everything to lose and nothing to gain. She feared God. She obeyed even when she didn't see a benefit. It means we obey God immediately. David made a statement. He said, I will hurry. This is Psalm 119. I will hurry to obey your commands. It means we'll obey God even if it hurts. The Bible says that Jesus obeyed the Father. He became a servant and obeyed the Father even to the point of death. And then Peter says, 
as Christ suffered for us in the flesh, arm yourself with the same mind. Now, religion says, I'm going to go find suffering to please the God, little G, I serve. Christianity says, I live in a fallen culture. I'm going to obey God, and I know I'm going to suffer as a result of it. Okay? It means we'll obey God to completion. King Saul did 99.99% of what God commanded him to do. God said, he's rebelled against me. Almost complete obedience is not obedience. Jesus said, when you've done all those things which you've been commanded, not 99% of those things, say we are unprofitable servants. We've only done that which is our duty to do. So the out the outflow, the evidence that somebody truly fears God is obedience. We don't obey to prove to people in God that we fear God. Mm-hmm. We fear God, and it gives us the power to obey. Mm-hmm. And why do you think so many people are missing this piece? It's not because of a lack of the love that we've preached. It's a lack of the fear. If you look at what Oswald Chambers says, it's amazing. He said, when we preach the love of God, we run into danger. That God doesn't reveal himself as a loving God in first in Scripture, but he reveals his blazing, intense holiness. And in the center of that holiness is his deep love for us. I love that quote. You know, the angels, as God reveals his glory every moment, the angels are crying out. They're not crying out faithful, faithful, faithful in Isaiah 6 and Revelations 5. They're crying out. They're not crying out love, love, love. Is God love? He, he doesn't have love. He is love. He is the very essence of love. But what they're crying out is holy, 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 which you can't separate holiness and the fear of the Lord. They, they go hand in hand, right? Just like love and mercy go hand in hand, right? Just like pride and rebellion go hand in hand. Holiness, the fear of the Lord, and true humility all go hand in hand. And so how can we neglect speaking about the holiness of God? Because if we neglect talking about the healthy fear of God, we can't really talk about the holy fear of God. We're actually dumbing down holiness. Does that make sense? I mean, here's Job. He's the most righteous man on the earth. And Job cries out, I've heard you by the hearing of the ear. And God said he was the most righteous man. I've heard you by the hearing of the ear. My eyes see you. I utterly abhor myself. Isaiah is a preacher of righteousness. Isaiah 5. Woe to those who call evil good, good, good evil. Woe to the wicked. Woe to the proud. Woe to those who linger long at the bottle. But he has one glimpse of God in Isaiah 6. And it's no longer woe is a sinner. It's woe is me. For the first time, he realizes who it is he's serving. John the Apostle was the closest one to Jesus, closest one. He sees Jesus in his glory on the island of Patmos and falls down like a dead man. I mean, we've got to remember, we're not... Yes, God wants to be our friend. He wants to be our friend, but he's not our buddy. Mm -hmm. Okay? And if if we're able to embrace that fear of God, like you mentioned... How does it give us peace and, and courage? So it's the it's the craziest thing. It's almost, how do I want to say it? It's almost um, counterintuitive. You would think if you're walking in a, a fear and trembling, you're not going to have peace. You're not going to have joy. <laughs> but experientially and from the Bible and from the Bible, the peace and the joy are mind blowing. Okay, can, can I just just listen? You know, I I found forty promises in my in my thirty years of studying and and really praying and seeking God. I found forty distinct promises that are only made to those who fear the Lord. Here, here's just a couple of them. Listen to this. Okay, um, Psalm one twelve. Everybody should read Psalm one twelve after this, right? How joyful, how joyful are those who fear the Lord? Then say how how sad, how terrified are those who fear the Lord? How joyful are those who fear the Lord and delight, delight in obeying his commands. Why? Because he works in you both the will and to do. So now obeying his commands is a delight, not a burden. Their children will be successful everywhere. Okay, they themselves will be wealthy. I didn't write that. Mm -hmm. I just wanted to know. Okay, (laughs) if if you've got a problem with that statement, talk to David. He wrote it. All right. Um, An entire generation of godly people will be blessed. You know what that means? Do you know what that means? Entire God, it means generations of blessed children. They are generous, people who fear the Lord. And it says, good comes to those 
And it says such people will not be overcome by evil. So there's another promise. You won't be overcome by evil. It says they do not fear bad news. What a day in the day of social media, the day of mainstream media for God to say, when you fear God, you don't fear man anymore. So you don't fear bad news. There is so much that God promises. They shall be secure, he says, on and on and on and on. And I'm like, wow, this is so much. And that's why I felt to write this book. And I thought, God, how do I write this book in a way that people read it? Because I'll tell you, Gen Z's and millennials don't tend to read a lot. And the Lord gave me an idea. I did 42 short chapters. It's not a devotional. It's just short chapters. You can read the chapter in five minutes. And then I've got a, uh, a devotional at the end of every chapter. And it's a systematic book. You can sit down and read it from cover to cover, or you can go 42 days, which is what, six weeks. And there is six sections of seven chapters. I just thought, I'm going to make this as easy as possible for people to read. And John, you and Lisa have raised four boys who are now Christian young men. What did you and your wife do to plant that seed in them? It's the fear of the Lord. Their children will be blessed and mighty on the earth. When children see their parents walking in the fear of God, what does the fear of God do? It centers me. In other words, I'm going to behave at home the way I behave in the pulpit. And they know that. I'm going to be quick to say I'm sorry to my children when I make a mistake because no dad's a perfect dad. Well, they've seen Lisa and I walk in this. And that's why all four of them have worked for Messenger International. We have... We have about a thousand team members all over the globe because one of the things that um, our passion at Messenger, when you said disciple the whole globe, it sounds a little a little uh, ostentatious. But in in 2011, in prayer, I felt God said, get your resources in the hands of every pastor in the world that can't afford them. Well, in the last 12 years, by the grace of God, we've been able to give away over 62 million resources. Wow. And what we have seen in traveling all over the world is the number one thing people are desperate for is discipleship resources in 47 languages of the world, 47 languages, reaching 675 million people. We're the only provider right now of discipleship resources. Now they have Bibles. Thank God for Bible Society, the Gideons, but they didn't have one book, not one course in their language. Uh, I'm thinking of Lisu, which is a million and a half people up in northern uh, Miramar. I'm thinking of Javanese speaking people, which there is like millions of Javanese speaking people. They didn't have one book, one course in their language, discipling them. And Jesus said, go into all the world and make disciples of all nations. So that's why that's, that's, that's what we're passionate about doing. And within Messenger International, you have the Messenger X app. Can you explain um, what that is for those of us who don't know? So um, one, of our, one of our partners who had given heavily financially, he went to Myanmar, Vietnam, and Mongolia with our international director. Well, he, wow. picked, me up, he picked me up at the airport. He was like on fire. He was like, <laughs> John, they got your book. And it was a month old and already been read by 10 people because he said what happened uh -huh. was our international director drove him eight hours in the middle of nowhere. He said, I'm out in the middle of nowhere in Mongolia. He said, there's this white tent. And he says, it's a church. And he said, I go in there and there's your book. They had gotten it just one month earlier and it had already been read. Wow, by that's amazing. It had already been read. It had already been read by 10 people, 10 leaders in the church, right? And he said they were just waiting for the 10th guy to finish. And he was so excited and I was so angry. And the reason I was so angry is I was like, nine guys had to wait for one guy to read it. What about all the other people who haven't read it yet? And I was frust frustrated. Well, that frustration got me to really seek God. And I said, we're going to develop an app and it's going to be a world-class app. Well, one of the top, top app makers in the world, they had done Lush, they had done L'Oreal, they had done, they have done uh, Royal Caribbean, they've done Maybelline. They... The CEO had been reading our books since he had been in college. When he heard we were looking for an app developer, he came and said, well, he flew up and said, I, I want this account. And I said, well, if you've got that much energy for it, yeah. Well, he put his best designers on it. They spent a year and a half. We launched it uh, in 2021, so two years ago. And it has been downloaded now. And, and I'm telling you, it's the number one app in the world in languages. We have 227 languages on it. Number six in the world is YouTube. They have 80 languages. Um, 
It has been downloaded now in 237 nations of the world in 22,500 cities in the world. This summer, we were getting on average 22,000 brand new people that were downloading it every week. But that's only the tip of the iceberg because in all these persecuted countries, they have to do shadow websites and they have to download it and secretly get it to each other. So we have no idea how many millions and millions and millions of people have gone have been going through it because they just are hungry for discipleship. I mean, this is what Jesus said. He said, go into all the world, and make disciples of all nations. He didn't say go make converts of all nations, make disciples. And so um, we are just really passionate about making sure that everybody has the word of God all over the world. Um, and, and, and so that's what we're doing. Well, what I was originally saying is all four of our sons have worked for us for at least nine years. One son now is is in his own business and he's doing really well. And I really felt like he was supposed to. Our other three sons have been working with us for years and years. One son's almost at 20 years. Um, you know, why? Why Why would these guys, I mean, we've tried to get rid of them. I mean, we've said, like, come on, guys, go do this, go do that. And they're like, no, we feel called here. And, you know, I I know I've made a ton of mistakes. I am a leader that I have had to write so many emails at two in the morning to my team and say, hey, the way I said it was totally off. What I said was right, but the way I said it was wrong. I am so sorry. And, you know, I it, I just look at it and I go, why would they stay? I don't I, I think they really see a dad who fears God and a mom who fears God. And I think there's security and safety. This is what our sons have said to us. I said, Why? Why? And they go, we feel safe with you and mom because you're so quick to repent. You're so quick to say, I'm sorry. You you are so quick to acknowledge that you made a mistake. And I guess that helps. Well, we are obviously at unapologetic, passionate about media and using it to share the gospel worldwide. Yeah. And through your messenger, XAP, you are just blessing so many people yeah. across the world. What is this milestone, some of these milestones mean to you, your team, and, and the kingdom, most importantly? I just feel honored to be able to be a servant of Jesus. So if I was called to be a pastor in a rural area with 300 people, I would seek with all my heart to do as faithfully and reach everybody in that rural area. We all have different assignments, Julianne. To be honest with you, I know there's going to be people standing in the front lines of heaven that none of us have ever heard of before because they weren't pulpit in the pulpits. They were called to pray and they spent hours in prayer. And because they obeyed and spent hours in prayer, I've had the strength to continue on. You've had the strength to continue on. To be really honest with you, I, I see God has given all of us responsibilities. And here's the way I see it. I can't add to what God has called me to do. The Bible says, I know whatever God does, it shall be forever. Nothing can be added to it, nothing taken from it. This is Ecclesiastes 3, 14 and 15, right? So I can't add anything to what God's called me to do. The only thing I can do is mess it up. And that causes me to fear. So if I mess it up, what does he do? He says, I've got another one standing in the wings and I'm going to get him or her to do what you were supposed mm -hmm. to do. Mm -hmm. And I want to close today. You just have so much wisdom and incredible experience. I want our, our listeners and viewers to have just some advice. If you could give them who maybe are wanting to start out in ministry, but maybe don't know how to make their dreams of reaching people with the gospel a reality. How would you encourage them? My encouragement would be to obey God. Everything we've done in this ministry has been birthed out of prayer. I remember the Lord made a statement to me one day. I was striving, struggling. And the Lord said, who ordained this ministry that you're called to, me or you? I said, well, you did. He said, don't you think I'm more concerned about my ministry than you are? And I remember that brought a real tremendous peace because, you know, Julianne, we live in the social media day, uh, Instagram, TikTok. Yep. <laughs> and people are putting their best, their best face forward and even exaggerating. And it puts a lot of pressure on people. Oh, I'm not, I'm not doing anything. I'm not doing anything. God will never compare you with somebody else. At the judgment, he's going to compare you to the truth that you were accountable to. And that is what he called you to do. And if that means that you're called to win one person, and let's say that person is the next Billy Graham, and you win that one person, and that's what he called you to do, then you have been obedient. 
And I just, I just say to people, get past, get past the, the flaunting of what we're doing. I, I just, nobody's more aware. You know, my worst subject was in high school, my very worst subject, English and creative writing. I scored 370 on the English and the SAT. In all my travels, I've only met two people that were scored worse than me on the SAT in English. It's okay. I was that way with math. So God, <laughs> it's fine. <laughs> so God, God came to me and said, son, I want you to write 1991. I was like, I laughed. I said, you got the wrong person. I mean, talk to my English teachers. It took me four hours to write a one-page paper. I, I, I became an engineer at Purdue University, so I wouldn't have to take English. And yet he was silent. And 10 months later, two women came to me from two different states within two weeks of each other. And they both said the exact same words. They said, John Bevere, if you don't write what God's given you to write, he'll give the message to somebody else and you'll be and you'll be judged for it. So when I look at this book, you want to know why my name's on that book? Because I was the first guy to get to read it. I know where those messages came from because I couldn't write. My English teachers knew I couldn't write. I think they, one, one English teacher, I think, passed me so they wouldn't have to have me the next year again. That's how bad I was. And so when I look at that, I realize, how could I ever take credit for any of this? How can any of us, Paul made the statement, he says, what do you have that you didn't receive? So why do you act as if you didn't receive it? What do any of us have? Anything that is good that we didn't, that we got on our own? Nothing. My character is not my character. He developed it in me. He gave me his nature, right? The Bible says that we might be to partakers of the divine nature. My ability to obey, that's the fear of the Lord that gets, works in me both the will. How can I take credit for, for any obedience I might have had? Four boys that love God with all their heart, how can I take any credit for that? Other than that, I just feared God and obeyed him. And that's what my advice would be to every young person. Don't get in this rat race of trying to show people something that you're not. Just be who God has called you to be and enjoy it. Amen. That is just the perfect way to wrap up the show. John, I can't thank you enough. How can our listeners keep up with you and your work? Uh, they can go to johnbevere.com, but if they want the book, don't do that. You'll have to enter your credit card, your address and all that stuff. Mm -hmm. Everybody's a prime member, right? <laughs> so just go to Amazon Prime. I, you say, John, Jeff Bezos is getting the money. I don't care. <laughs> God's got all the money on the, in the, in the entire universe. I know that if you just have to do one click, you'll get this message. Mm -hmm. And I know what this message will do in your life. I know what it will do. Mm -hmm. And so get that. If you want to know more about our ministry, go to johnbevere.com or messengerinternational.com. That will do it too. Thank you for tuning into this episode of Unapologetic. Remember, you can get episodes like this and more at ptv.org slash Julia.